would like to thank the organizer for uh, inviting me to uh, provide this presentation. So it's a great time for uh, to present the instrument foremost because we are just uh, finishing the to build the instrument this year. Uh, so foremost is actually a, a facility. It's a, a dedicated instrument for the Vista telescope uh, in Chile, a four meter class telescope. And because it's a multi-object spectrograph uh, with a very high multiplex, it has a multi-purpose um, well, it's a multi-purpose instrument, and I'm going to focus more particularly on the cosmology aspects uh, that we can do with uh, FORMOS. So, in a nutshell, what is uh, FORMOS? So it's a wide field, high multiplex optical spectroscopic survey facility. Uh, so, it has three spectrographs uh, linked to uh, fibers. So, we have two low resolution spectrograph and one high resolution spectrograph. In total, it's covering 2,400 targets simultaneously. So two, two thirds of the targets are with a medium resolution of 5,000 to 7,000, and one third of the target to 20,000. And they're all run in parallel. And so I'm going to focus more on the low resolution spectrograph. This is what we are using in particular for cosmology. And so uh, we are covering a wavelength range between 370 and 950 nanometers. And the field of view has a diameter of 22.5 square degrees. So the, the full field of view is four square degrees. Um, so the operations, we say it's here 2022, it's probably going to start end 2023, beginning 2024, for a few five years uh, run of observations. So the science is very diverse, goes from cosmology, galaxy evolution, but also galactic science. There's a lot of galactic science as well with uh, complementary to Gaia observations. So I'm gonna, not gonna talk at all about uh, the galactic science. Uh, so I'm going to focus about the complementary aspects of, uh, of uh, FOMOS with uh, Erosita, uh, Euclid in particular and the ground-based surveys like uh, DES and LSST. So it's a survey facility, so we are providing the instrument with the foremost consortium, but also all the science operations, the data products, and of course the science. Uh, we are running five, well, the five years public surveys all in parallel with also community surveys that have been selected through ESO. So although it's an ESO facility, the, the concept of operation is different from what people are used to, for example, at the very large telescope. So just uh, quickly on the facility itself. So the telescope exists, it's a Vista telescope, but there have been quite a few new elements added to be able to use foremost. For example, the wide field corrector, uh, which is a very large piece here that adapts the field of view to the, the needs of foremost. All the cable wraps for the fibers, so that goes around uh, here. And then in the end, the focal plane with uh, uh, the positioner. So I will mention a bit more the positioner after that. And then the three boxes, the two black boxes here and the white boxes here as the three spectrograph. And uh, in Lyon Observatory at Tral, we are building these two low resolution spectrographs. So it's quite an important piece of the, of the optic of the system. So the AAO, Australis in, uh, in Australia, is uh, providing the fiber positioners called ASOP. So the, the design of the, it's called the Echidna design. The idea is to have uh, a spine, the different spines here. You have a, uh, an example here, how the spines are moving. You apply a piezoelectric current to the end of the of the spine to tilt it, and this way you can have a patrol field and cover all the targets you want. So two thirds of the target has low resolution; these are in blue, and the yellow ones are the high resolution targets. And so you have the patrol field here that shows how far you can move the spine by tilting them with a, a piezoelectric current. Um, after the fiber feed, you have the low resolution spectrograph. This is a view of the interior of the box inside the low resolution spectrograph. This is a picture was taken at Kral 
where we just finished to, well, we finished to integrate the, the two spectrographs uh, in Lyon and we sent them and reintegrated them in Potsdam. So Potsdam is a PI institute. And so that's where all the facility uh, elements will be uh, uh, shipped uh, and tested before sending to Chile. And so we're really in the final stage. So we've done all our subsystems here. And just a few words on the spectrograph itself. So it's a three arm spectrograph. You have uh, the entrance slits here and the collimator and you divide the, the wavelength range in three pieces with dichroics. So you have a blue arm, a green arm and a red arm. And this way you can cover the full wavelength range uh, from really UV to, uh, to infrared. So you, to be able to cover all this uh, wavelength range and cover 800 fibers per spectrograph, uh, we need 6K by 6K detectors, so very large uh, CCDs, which are uh, cooled down. And this is a resolving power. I said mentioned uh, about 5,000. It goes up to 7,000 in the in the end of each uh, green and uh, red arm. Here. So the operation, the, we have a unique operations model for most instruments, and that should be suitable for most of the science cases. So we have public surveys of, uh, with a run of five years. So we are already providing a full catalog for the five years. We have to be ready at the start of the, the operation of the instruments to be able to run for five years. Uh, so we have consortium survey and community surveys, but all the surveys are run in parallel. So when you have a field of view, you can have, for example, let's say 200 fibers for one survey, 300 fibers for another survey, etc. Everything is run in parallel to be able to optimize so each piece of the sky here is optimized to, to be able to cover all the needs of the survey. So of course, there's a lot of uh, discussion and preparation and, uh, and competition as well in sky because everyone wants to look at the same pieces of sky. So it's, it's very important that we have all this coordination and there's a lot of work on the simulation to be able to do that. Um, so the surveys cover both, well, I mentioned galactic archaeology, Gaia follow up, up to cosmology through galaxy evolution and high energy sky with a Erosita follow up. Um, and this is an example, for example, of a target distribution. So in red, these are the targets we want to observe. Sometimes you can see they are very clustered. This is comparison with the field of view of the, of the moon. And in black, you see how the fibers are allocated. So you can see that you're not able to cover all the targets very clustered like that. So you have to do multiple passes. In total, we have 18 surveys. Uh, so 10 surveys, which are the consortium surveys, and then eight another uh, extra surveys, which come from the community. Although there's a few extra bits, I won't go into the details. And for the next slide, I'm going to focus only on the, the ones which I underline in red, which are covering cosmology and a bit of galaxy evolution. Uh, regarding galaxy evolution, the wave survey is kind of looking very deep at the pencil beam survey. So we have uh, 10 square degrees, 100 square degrees, 1000 square degrees. So a few pencil beams on sky. Uh, we're going drilling up to redshift one and performing kind of SDSS like uh, survey. So going deep and complete in redshift and, uh, and magnitude up to redshift one. And the idea here is to look at the growth of structure at uh, very tiny scales down to one kiloparsec uh, up to, to redshift one and looking for the evolution of uh, mass energy budget. For the cosmology, there's the Erosita complement. So uh, Erosita is this uh, X-ray uh, full sky survey that uh, so German Russian mission. Uh, so now it's on hold, but it's been it has observed half of the the total mission, um, and so it has sufficient targets to be able to feed the foremost uh, uh, survey to follow up clusters and AGN. So there's a strong cosmological strength on from galaxy cluster evolution by counting extended X-ray sources as clusters and also AGN evolution by looking at the compact sources. So these are the kind of diagrams we're looking at with for cosmology. So uh, um, measuring the cosmological parameters between omega M and sigma eight 
through the measurement of the redshift of clusters. Uh, so the survey strategy of Erosita is covering this uh, fraction of the field of view. And if we uh, cut at the foremost follow-up, so foremost we cover only the thousand part and we follow up the spectroscopy, there's an extra bit which will be follow up in the north uh, to cover the, the rest. Um, for the AGN, the goal is to look at 800,000 AGNs with a goal of 1.3 million up to redshift I mean, at any redshift. Uh, so the, the science goal is to look at the X-ray AGN luminosity function and measure clustering in BAO using uh, AGN. This is very complementary to what we're going to do with uh, the cosmology survey, which I'm going to talk about next. So the cosmology survey is looking at dark energy and general relativity tests by measuring the cosmic expansion history of the universe and the cross of structure. So we can look at the distribution in redshift using tracers. So we have at redshift up to one, we have bright galaxies and luminous red galaxies. And uh, at high redshift, we have uh, quasars and AGNs. To be able to use them as tracers, we need very bright sources at high redshift. And we use that as the tracers for the structure the, for the underlying dark matter structures. This is an example of uh, simulation on one side and uh, and prediction from the, the the location of galaxies through the the bias here. So it's hard to be competitive with uh, the northern survey, which will be, which is Daisy, which has already started and is providing very good well will provide very good BAO measurements. In terms of uh, number of targets and the timeline, they have started already and so on. So our synergy with foremost cosmology survey is to have uh, synergies with thousand facilities. We want to do cross correlation with other surveys that provide extremely good weak lensing measurements, like the test survey, and also synergies with radio and CMB surveys. So we have the SCAR and the SCAR Pice Finder in the south and also all the CMB experiments that are happening in the south. And for the moment, they can provide the best quality of imaging to select targets until we have access to LSST. And when we have access to LSST, that will be very good complementarity between very high image quality and, uh, and the foremost uh, spectroscopic uh, capability. So the, the region we're covering with the cosmology survey is shown here in black. So we have two main regions in the Northern Galactic Cap and the Southern Galactic Cap. This part is really covering and complementing the death part. We are not uh, duplicating what is done with DAISY. And we're also extending towards the kids regions, which are the gray regions here. This part is used, we're using the Atlas uh, survey. So we make use of all the, the DECAM imaging facility of the legacy survey imaging uh, uh, catalogs as input to our target selection. So a few more words of the, our target selection. As I mentioned, we're using bright galaxies and luminous red galaxies. These are the typical redshift distribution we expect from our selection. So between redshift zero and redshift one, we have two complementary target selection here, bright galaxies, BGs, and uh, luminous red galaxies, LRGs. And then at higher redshift, we moved up to redshift 3.5 and uh, well, up to up to 3.5 with quasars um, with a peak distribution at redshift 1.5 to 2. So these are the redshift range and the density. So we separate, we have kind of four sub-surveys where we select the bright galaxies, luminous red galaxies, quasar and quasar lime and alpha. We distinguish the quasar lime and alpha because they're uh, interested by themselves because you have the lime and alpha forest. Uh, up after redshift 2.2, you start to get the red lime and alpha forest and you can use the lime and alpha forest if you have enough information as an individual tracer for the structure along the line of sight. So you have all the imprint of the lime and alpha forest to, to the quasar background source. And that gives you a very, good measurements on the, on the uh, growth of structure. So I won't go into the details, but these are examples of our target selection. We're using infrared, uh, near infrared and infrared measurements from uh, Vista, VHS, and uh, WISE uh, to select our bright galaxies and luminous red galaxies. So these are uh, fine-tuned uh, target selection with color-color measurements 
uh, based on PhotoZ, uh, on, on CFHTLS or other PhotoZ catalogs. And for the quasar, we're using the uh, infrared X-Rex and the UV access to select the quasar measurement. Um, so now going more into the science, we want to use uh, the distribution of galaxies with redshift uh, across the sky and along the line of sight to be able to measure the redshift space distortion. So locally, if we plot the distribution of galaxies as a function of the projected offsets on one side and the line of sight offset, so the redshift on the other side, we are able to make this kind of diagram to measure the redshift space distortion. We show here the when we have very large motion with a big structure, you can see the finger of God effect here. Whereas on the outskirts here, you can see the coherent flow. And by measuring the distinction between the two, we can have a measurement of the anisotropy of this uh, redshift space distortion. And that's a typical measurement we can use to compare uh, with the prediction from, uh, for example, general relativity. And to give you an example, we have, uh, if we combine, for example, lensing and RST, we can test uh, the theories of gravity, so uh, cosmology. Um, but for example, if we perturb the F, uh, FRW metric, uh, we have two potentials that appear with C and phi, which are the metric gravitational potentials. They should be identical in general relativity, but if you go to a different theory or for a different uh, lambda la, dif, a theory different than lambda CDM, they could be different. Uh, and if you have relativistic particles, they would collect equal contribution from uh, C and phi, whereas non-relativistic particles, they only uh, look at the experiment only the Newtonian potential psi, phi, uh, phi, psi, sorry, psi. So if we have a difference between the two, then we will see the difference between weak lensing and the rich space distortion. And one of the tests that people have been uh, using, started to use, is the uh, so-called gravitational slip statistics. So it's constructed using beta, which is a RSD measurement, and this uh, annular differential surface density cross correlation, which are based from weak lensing. So with the weak lensing give you, you the underlying dark matter distribution. And if you do look at the autocorrelation and the cross correlation here, we can have these measurements. Uh, it's designed to be able to, uh, to be independent from the bias and sigma eight. And in the end, if you are in general relativity, you should, be, you should get precisely omega m over f, with f being the growth, of, the growth rate of structure. And uh, so by doing this test, you are able to test, okay, are we really in general relativity or do we need a different theory? Or maybe it's not that general relativity is wrong, but maybe we go beyond uh, lambda CDM and we need a very more complex uh, model than lambda CDM. The prediction is that with FORMOS and uh, LSST, we will have 7,500 square degrees of very high quality uh, weak lensing imaging. And if we combine with the spectroscopy, we will be able to lower by a factor of four uh, the error bar on the gravitational slip measurements. This is the, uh, the prediction from general relativity. And you can see the error bar, it will be very tiny at high redshift. And we should be able to test if there is a deviation from general relativity. Um, going briefly here, the, the spectroscopic measurement is also very important for photo-Z calibration. Photo-Z is uh, one of the leading systematics for weak lensing tomography. When people are using weak lensing, they have to rely uh, most of the time on photo-Z and having a proper redshift measurement, spectroscopic measurement of the underlying uh, lenses and sources is, uh, is very important, for example, to test for uh, outliers and degeneracy with galaxy bias, for example. And so combining lensing and SPEC-Z in, in general, it's, uh, we can improve the RSD measurements on the lenses. We can make very specific selection from the lenses and the sources and say, okay, if we select these as lenses, these are sources, what are the weak lensing measurements? We have a very really much cleaner and robust uh, weak lensing measurements. 
Um, so I won't go into these details, but these are other measurements that we can do. Uh, void is also very important because uh, there's a peak of the, the, well, the, the limits on the void distribution is very important at low redshift. And this is a peak where uh, the four FS, the four CRS, the cosmology redshift survey, we have very, very good tests. So by combining foremost and DC, for example, we have very good tests here on the void, uh, uh, um, sorry, on the void uh, limit, uh, in cloud limit. If we combine the erosita measurement on clusters, with our void measurements, so on both extreme sides of the, the structure, so cluster, a very high density, and voids on the other side, we can have even much uh, smaller tests on dark energy and dark energy evolution, so the W0, WA measurement. Uh, BAO and growth rate, as I mentioned, DAISY is really already very, very competitive. It's not very good to be more competitive, but of course we will test if the, we reproduce the DAISY measurement and we will also combine the DAISY and foremost measurement together. And finally, the last survey I wanted to mention is the LSST, so the time domain, so looking at the supernovae follow-up. Uh, so complementary to the LSST, Vera Rubin Observatory uh, measurements of supernovae. So there's different possibilities from the survey. So there is a live transient, so doing a rapid response measurement of spectroscopy and measuring the spectra of the supernovae, but also measuring simply the redshift of the host. There have been hundreds or thousands of uh, supernovae to flow up in the lifetime of LSST. So every time with a former survey, we'll be able to add more host uh, galaxy measurements for supernovae. So the survey strategy is to select start the targets from the LSST survey, VRO, and then uh, also doing reverberation mapping AGN. So there have been a lot of repeats looking at the LSST deep fields in particular, but also supernovae hosts distributed everywhere over the entire sky. So I jump to the conclusions here. So FOMOS is really the next facility for very large survey at ESO. It's a complex scheme to be able to run in parallel galactic and extragalactic surveys at the telescope. So the cosmology redshift survey, we perform really cosmological tests, stringent tests uh, using clustering measurements, using the best uh, weak lensing data and the cosmic CMB and SK and the measurements in the southern hemisphere. Um, by combining lensing and spectroscopy, we have well, I've shown that we can do improvements on GR tests and the study of structures. So most of the formal subsystems are ready for integration in post -time. We have integrated now the two low resolution spectrograph. The PAE, the acceptance in Europe is scheduled for September, 2023, with the start of operation in 2024. And I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Han, for a very nice uh, talk. Any questions? Yeah, Vivek. Okay. So uh, my question is like, uh, sorry. hello. Yeah. So uh, so you have like uh, ten uh, parallel uh, projects running right simultaneously, and each of them would have a different uh, signal noise thresholds. So how how do you operate it? Like operating wise, like uh, when each of them will have a different signal noise. So how would you stop some some projects and then so how is it done uh in formal? so yeah so the the idea is uh, it's really the challenge i would say it's to if you're going too short then you're not very efficient but if you so we are trying to find the the minimum exposure time to be able to uh, satisfy uh, the surveys that don't need very high signal to noise and the targets that need higher signal to know that we'll do multiple repeats. And it seems to work because we're trying to feel, well, and we have selected the surveys in order to be complementary, to be able to be as efficient as possible. And this is really, the, the challenge is really in the simulation here. We're doing very complex simulations that show that with multiple paths, you know, in the first pass, you, you satisfy most of the surveys that want the lower signal to noise. And the, the, the surveys that need a higher signal to noise, they will continue to observe the same targets perhaps uh, longer. 
Uh, and then, of course, then you you kind of invoice the the cost of the exposure time to each survey proportionally to the signal to noise request. So it's just um, it's a matter also of trust that people really ask only what they need and they don't rely on other surveys to to provide them a higher signal to noise target. So there's a lot of discussion now about uh, sharing targets and so on. But uh, but even the, between the consortium survey and the community survey, there's really not so much distinction. Okay, so one follow-up question. Uh, are the community surveys open for uh, outside Europe people, or is it uh, only restricted for you? So, so the surveys are already selected. So there have, have been already a selection of survey, like uh, as I mentioned, everything is really ready. We are uh, providing now the full catalogs, almost ready to run to, well, it's not like you press the button and you run it, but it's something like that. Um, but uh, this is for the first five years of service. Then of course, the next five years, there will be a new call for uh, for community surveys and uh, with uh, even more time to the community survey. So 70% of the fiber hours. So if we count the full time spent of the telescope on fiber times hours, is uh, for the consortium survey, 20% for the community and 10% for Chile as usual. But everything really is run in the parallel scheme. Okay, finally, like, uh, is the data, um, will you be public after some time? Yes, so the, 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 the raw data will be, well, there will be data release of the, all the reduced data. The, the raw data, but it's very complex and there will not be the, the selection function or target selection already provided uh, uh, shortly. So the raw data will be provided very quickly, but the, what's important is the reduced data will be, there will be a few data release. We are still working on release the schedule of this data release, but there will be, uh, the idea is like six months after operation, there will be already data releases. Okay. Any other questions? We talk also about follow up the test scale, whereas SK phase one is expected somewhere in uh, uh, 2029. So by then, I guess phase one or foremost will be almost done, isn't it? Yeah, so I, I, I think what, what I mean here is that what I mean, we are doing a very homogeneous. Uh, with the cosmology survey, homogeneous coverage with redshift of bright galaxies and energies over the full southern sky. So there will be a huge database of redshifts from which we can use afterwards, you know, it could be before or after you do cross correlation. So you can, whenever it's ready, you can perform the cross correlation between the, it could be, you know, supernova host, but here with SK, it will be, you know, radio measurements at low redshift. Of, uh, of galaxies uh, from bright, bright galaxies. And I think that will be already quite uh, important. So by 2029, we'll be ready. But of course, uh, the next phase. So uh, in the next phase, so there's a few, normally that should be three times five years uh, phases or foremost. And of course, for the next phase, we could well include more of the SK follow-up than uh, we could do for the first one. But that doesn't stop us to use SK pathfinders, which are already existing in the southern hemisphere with the phase one uh, or foremost. So we don't already do the uh, preparatory science case for SK right from now. Yes. Okay, yes. so then uh, do you already have some? So I see that there are certain fields, uh, so survey areas which have been identified. And uh, do you already have some kind of specific targets that you people have come up with? Or is there a possibility to add or propose new targets to those fields or it's very strict or so? No, that's that the difficulty here. We're really talking about the statistics and the full uh, set of targets. Uh, once you have a target catalog, you're not supposed to change it over the five years, something like that. Uh, it's not completely true. There will be some adjustment and so on, but the adjustment will be on a large pool of targets. It's not like, but now we haven't discussed, but well, there, there will be a pool of backup targets that people can uh, add. And then, you know, whenever there is an empty fiber and you have 
free space, of course, there will be opportunity to add uh, targets like that. So I think that would be the best opportunity is to add an interesting targets uh, to this pool of uh, backup targets. Perfect. And then just quick last question. What do you want from radio uh, service, basically, for these sources? Well, for the, for I think what's important is to do cross correlation with uh, the H1 measurements and the, the, and the red shifts. I think here it's a uh, uh, particular. That's already okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Long live India and France friendship.